Hello. Passionate about sustainability, energy, and climate? You're in the right place. Welcome to Energetic. I'm Maureen Cornelis, and together we will engage with people who dedicate their lives to climate justice and making a just energy transition happen. They may be activists, scientists, policymakers, or other enthusiasts, just like you. Let the life stories and insights inspire you to build a better future for people and the planet. Welcome to the first episode of Energetic. Today, my guest is Marta Garcia Paris. Marta is the CEO of EcoService, the organization that has undoubtedly transformed the way in which energy poverty is addressed in Barcelona and in Europe. Since 2007, she has been managing projects and advocating for vulnerable consumers' rights at local, national, and urban levels. Hi, Marta. Hi. Thanks for inviting my pleasure. It's an honor to have you here. So, Marta, I already aroused the attention of the people who are listening to us. So, can you tell us what EcoService is and what your activities are? We are a non-profit association and we work as a, a strategic innovation consultancy in Yeah, in topics related to energy, climate, transport, mobility. I mean, our aim is to identify the energy challenges affecting people and to propose solutions. This is the mission of the organization. And then this means that, that we need to adapt and react fast as the challenges changes every, every year or every period. So I'm curious, what are the challenges that you are facing right now and that you hadn't planned on the way? Yeah, EcoServace started in 1992, facing um, one of the biggest challenges at that time that was that renewable energies existed at that time, but there were a, a lot of barriers when trying to implement renewable energies at a larger scale. So there are, for example, legal barriers or cultural bar barriers or social barriers, financial barriers. So this is how we started in EcoServace. Now the challenges, some of them are similar because there are still many, many challenges when trying to make uh, renewable energies a mainstream. I mean, to, to be that, that everyone can have a renewable access to renewable energies at home or, or energy efficiency. But one of the major challenges we're facing now is the relation between, I mean, the vulnerabilities related to energy or to climate uh, change adaptation or to energy transition. So these are like the three focus that we have now open. How does that uh, translate in practice? Yeah, for example, um, we can hear many voices talking about um, ensuring a just energy transition. But the reality is that what we can see uh, within citizens is that citizens cannot access the information to reach this energy transition, not all the citizens. So All those who can access the information or can benefit from this energy transition. The access to finance is not the same to, to everyone. So, for example, if you want to install a photovoltaic installation in your house, for example, you need also some financing mechanism and not everyone has, has access to that. And so this is not, not a real energy transition for everyone. So, yeah, in practical, we try to mobilize uh, different stakeholders in order to ensure that everyone can access this transition. And uh, in particular, you are managing the uh, energy information points in Barcelona. Am I right? Yeah, the, the energy advice points in Barcelona, it's a public service run by, by the local municipality, by Ayuntamiento de Barcelona. They have like 10 offices in, in the whole cities, in the whole city to give advice on energy topics and with the ultimate objective of identifying energy poverty in the city. This uh, public service is coordinating by EcoSurveys and by a social organization. So we have made tandem with a social organization called ABD, ABD. So um, we can give a complete service, which means giving technical advice, but also reaching those in vulnerability. And uh, one of the interesting things of this service is that apart from the technical, I mean, or for, for the advice that, that we give to, to the Barcelona society in general, I mean, people working in this energy advice points are people 
that suffered energy poverty sometimes. So where people, not maybe now, but with a past situation of vulnerability. So this is, um, we tested the model of the peer-to-peer -peer advice. And how did you manage to engage them? And how did you identify these people in the first place? Because maybe our listeners are not so familiar with the concept of energy poverty. So, so could you expand a bit on this? You mean, for example, in the in the energy advice point in Barcelona, right? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, these are um, physical offices, of course. Now with the COVID situation, we we've turned to yeah to virtual sometimes, and we are we are coming back to face to face again. But in a normal situation, I mean, uh, we have offices in every district in the city, and the offices are placed in municipal premises, like the public, uh, for example, uh, the local authority building, for example, or I mean, the, a public building, for example, where people can enter and receive the advice. So it is quite an open service to everyone. You can access if you want. Furthermore, I mean, we are in touch with different services in the city, for example, with social services or with social organizations or charities dealing with vulnerable uh, people too. So they send the files of these people too. So we give advice them. Okay. And what kind of vulnerability or problems are they facing that make you think that they should be helped in a greater way or that they need particular support? And, uh, and how do you help them also to, to cope with the uh, climate transition or the just transition that you, that you talked about at the beginning of our conversation? How do you engage them? I mean, the, the objective of, of the service in the case of Barcelona is to, to give advice, I mean, to try to solve a punctual situation because they, they have entered the service. But of course, the idea is to empower them and to give them information. What we have realized is that people need more information in order to, to improve their relation to, to energy, for example. So only by giving some energy advice or um, energy bill information, we see a, a huge impact in their in their relation to energy. And how did you come to realize this? What was the, in your personal career, in your building uh, projects, how did you learn this process of, how did you manage to engage first? What is your uh, personal motivation behind all this? I mean, I think there is not a magic formula and, and we need to adapt with every citizen and with every situation because all, Each situation has, has peculiarities and, and differences. But the main thing is that just by giving information, just by providing information, you can unblock certain situations. So, for example, if you have your energy supply or your electricity supply with X uh, company, only by giving information on tariffs and protection, existing protection measures, for example, you can unblock an unpaid situation or an unpaid bill or, yeah, or an, an energy cut. I mean, there are, yeah, there are specific um, points on the energy bill or on the energy use at home, but each person has its problems in related to energy. Have you seen the uh, situation evolve since the year now that we are facing the uh, COVID lockdowns? What has been your view, your takes on on the situation or on the evolution of the situation? I mean, I have no, I mean, I, I don't have um, statistical data to prove that, but from our experience here in Barcelona in other, and in other services, just with the COVID period, we have more situation of energy vulnerability just because people is, spend more time at home. And this means the whole summer last year and now the winter. So if last year you were at your workplace or at any other place, not at your home during the daytime, now you are at home working at, at home. So you need heat, more heating systems, more cooling systems in, in winter. And yeah, and your energy expenditure grows. I mean... And if you have had a, yeah, a, personal, a difficult personal situation during COVID with less work or less payment in terms of, of financial status of your, of your income, yeah, 
the more situations of energy vulnerability are, are have has arisen. Okay, and I also mentioned that you have been managing different projects and advocating for vulnerable consumers' rights at uh, local, national, and European levels. Can you tell us a bit more about the European projects uh, that you're involved in and how this has fed your understanding on how to advocate better for the vulnerable people? How it's changing with other European counterparts has helped you along the way. We've been working since the beginning with European projects. So for us, this is our this is part. I mean, this is where we learn. We don't invent or reinvent the wheel. We only, I mean, open the window and see what other countries in Europe are doing or are saying or are identifying as as challenges. For example, that happens. I mean, there is a very Real, or I mean, I can explain the experience with energy poverty, for example, in, in 2006. Some European colleagues from UK and France invited us to a European Intelligent Energy Europe proposal on energy poverty. And when we received it, I remember saying, we don't have energy poverty in, in, in the Mediterranean. I mean, we have a very temperate climate. This is not a southern problem. And I remember that colleague saying, "Okay, but try to look some statistics or some national data. And then when I started looking at uh, national silk data and I realized that Spain and Portugal, I mean, had the, the, the more excess winter mortality rate. I said, OK, we have a problem here. And, and I remember another figure that was that nine percent of the Spanish population couldn't maintain or couldn't keep the temperature uh, at home. In winter, and I thought, okay, maybe we have the problem. So I remember typing energy poverty in, in Google in, in Spanish, and it didn't appear as, as, as wording. So it didn't exist. So yeah, this is how how we started working on energy poverty. Um, so yeah, I mean, learning from European projects and from from other countries in Europe has been essential to um, to eco surveys and to and our contribution to the collective actions uh, in energy transition in, in Barcelona and Catalonia in, in, and in Spain in general. That is absolutely fascinating because um, yeah, you you can really see how you got um, your project got nurtured and how experience from other people can really change your own experience and your situation uh, on the ground. So that's absolutely fascinating. And and what other things did you learn on the way? I'm really curious about all those experiences with the European counterparts and how you translated that into the Barcelona or Catalonian or Spanish uh, context. Yeah, for example, following with, with the example of energy poverty, I remember this first uh, European project. It was called EPEE and was the very first project on energy poverty, European energy project on energy poverty. And the aim of, the, of this project was to work on the definition and on the legal recognition of, of the concept in Europe. So we worked on that. But at the same time, time we were learning how were the other countries acting within this problem. And for example, I remember um, learning from France, training their social operators on energy issues. So we thought, okay, uh, we are working now on identifying and, and setting, I mean, and, and giving a visualization of energy poverty in Spain and giving and trying to, to get recognition for the problem. But we need to work with multipliers in order to yet yeah, to eradicate the problem. So we started training social workers here in Spain because we learned that from, from the French experience, for example. Okay. And now is France looking uh, at you and, and do you think that they are also learning from you? How does that, uh, does the cooperation continue? Yeah, yeah. For example, in, in another European project, it was called ASSIST. And after, I mean, if we started in 2006, I mean, ASSIST ended last year, so 2020, a lot. I mean, we've been doing a lot on on energy poverty and training also. And, and for us, what we wanted to see from or to test from this pilot was if training people with a, with an emotional bond with the vulnerable consumers was more useful in terms of the efficiency of an energy intervention, for example. And it, and it wasn't tested before in Europe. So we tested here in in Barcelona, 
and it was a success. And now, I mean, we have other countries um, trying to scale this model. And for example, we are in another project now called SWEET from the European Social Catalyst Fund, where we are going to scale to make the European scalability plan of this uh, intervention model. Wow, that's really, uh, that's so interesting. And I wish you the very best for this project because I, I having been to, to Barcelona and having met uh, with the social workers that have been trained, I, I think that they are doing an amazing job in engaging with people who are not even aware that they can get some benefits and that they can get a particular help for the situations that they are they are living in so i think it will be amazing for to have a replicability of this project in uh, in other cities in europe and in the rest of the world so how would you like things to to go in which direction and what's the biggest area where you are curious about and wh where would you like to expand in the future Yeah, in EcoSurveys now we are working with, uh, I would say, four approaching uh, channels to citizens. For example, we have the the vulnerability issue, I mean, the inequalities. And here we are working at different projects on energy poverty, but also um, mobility inequalities or related to adaptation. I mean, or for example, the, the effects of the climate change on vulnerable people, because we think we need to work on the adaptation of these people because they need specific support because we will have, um, I mean, heat waves, for example, in Europe, that will be a reality and we need to protect those on vulnerability. So we have this sector where, where we have projects and, and initiatives going on. We have also the, the energy transition and the global change focus too because we want to, to ensure an energy transition and to ensure that citizens have access to, to the information. So here we are working on different projects on one-stop shops and energy transition offices in, in different regions. We have also projects trying to engage youth, but not uh, articulating the movement. And this is a, this is a thing of, of the youth movements are, are already doing, but trying to link these movements with the real policy. So here we, we are working on some projects trying to To work on these links and also we are exploring and yeah, working on different projects also on, on on sports because we think that through sports we can give the message of sustainability and and energy transition too that's so interesting this focus on youth and sports it's it's absolutely it's very original how did you came up with this idea i mean also looking what Citizens are doing in their real lives. I mean, we we were watching the the Fridays for Future movement, movement, for example, and their previous uh, movements, and also with sports. I mean, talking to citizens and and uh, yeah, and, and seeing that if we could articulate some projects related in these areas, we could increase the effectivity you know, of this of these areas. Yeah. So, so what I really like about your approach is that you take this kind of observation, then bottom-up empowerment. You don't want too much. I mean, my understanding is that you don't want to disturb people, but you just want to nudge them into the energy and climate transition, into overcoming vulnerability, etc. So instead of trying to spread the word uh, from a a top-down approach, you try to, to engage with them like on a daily basis. And uh, that's very, very interesting and very uh, inspiring because we, we see so many, so many projects that don't really take off because they are too kind of vertical and people don't feel that it's about them. They, they feel quite disengaged. So what can you tell us about this way of approaching the kind of uh, innovation, social innovation through the, the bottom I mean, this is our reason of existing. I mean, we came, I mean, previous to EcoSurveys, the founders of EcoSurveys were part of an energy cooperative and, and things were, I mean, we're doing like the top, on the other way around. So the idea or the objective while EcoSurveys exists is because we need the bottom-up approach. I mean, the problem is not the technology in terms of renewable energy. There are other problems. So um, society is facing challenges. So we need to feed from these challenges. So for us in EcoSurveys, citizens are the experts and we are only translating this 
uh, expertise into into challenges and, and initiatives and trying to solve them. So for us, this is uh, this is the basis. And you already have quite a good experience with the uh, with vulnerable people who are now training or informing other people about their their energy rights, etc. So how will you do that with the sports and young people? What is your plan? We, I mean, we are we are um, already engaged in different projects. We are coordinating uh, three projects on sports, three Erasmus on sports: play green, green coach, and and striker. And yeah, we coordinate the European projects, and we work with, uh, for example, football federations. So we look for the key stakeholders in the topic to work from there. This in the case of sport, and in the case of of youth, the same. We are also coordinating projects in this area, and we work with and specific stakeholders related to youth. And this project with the sports, where can we find more information about it? Where, what's the yeah, we have three project? projects on sports. You can check all the information on the website. One is called Play Green, the other one is called Green Coach, and the third one is called Striker. And the three of these projects are Erasmus Sports. Yeah, and they have different... Yeah, uh, but all related to, to sustainability in general, yeah. Okay. And for the project with young yeah, people... Yeah, the same. We, have, we are coordinating two projects, two Erasmus, two. One is called ICE, and the other one is called Climate Tubers. So we will work on... This has just started, and we will work with participatory videos with youth people. So these are the, the two, but at national and local level, we have also projects at, with these approaches, as, as well as with the energy transition and the vulnerabilities of inequalities. I mean, we try to yeah, to work at different levels in order to feed and to enrich the local initiatives. But of course, mm -hmm. we need the, the European approach to, to, to learn. Absolutely, absolutely. And so what are your your expectations for the, for the future? Expectations, you mean our challenges, for example, I mean, where we want to focus, we are really trying to, yeah, to work on the, on ensuring the just energy transition with, with all its implications. I mean, ensuring that vulnerable people or people in a situation of vulnerability can access the energy transition, but also to ensure that citizens play a central role, not only in, in a wording terms, but in a real, in real terms. I mean, we want citizens to play a role in the energy transition. Yeah, as you said, they are the experts and we just have to listen to yeah, them. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is how we work. I mean, this is how we identify the real challenges and, and yeah, we just try to to propose solutions. Sometimes they don't work at all and sometimes they are a success. Yeah, it's not always a, an easy path. <laughs> And if you had one message to send to our listeners, what would that be? Like some hopes or some expectations or something that we can be excited about for you? What would that be? If we, if we, I mean, if I'm thinking now, some that some professionals are on the other side of the of the headphones now, it's like it, we need to to listen to people. I mean, we need, they will tell us what to do or how to act and how to work, yeah, to ensure this energy transition. Okay. Thank you so much, Marta. It was super interesting. And thank you, Marine, for, for contacting me. It's a pleasure. Thanks for listening to Energetic. I hope you enjoyed our deep dive into sustainability and the just energy transition with the most inspiring stakeholders. All links and resources are in the show notes. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like this podcast, why not recommend it to a friend or a colleague? To continue the conversation, head on over to Twitter or LinkedIn. Thank you for lending your ears. That's all for this episode. Until next time.